participants in. So hello, welcome. Thank you guys for being here. We are at part one of our three equity series, and it will be facilitated by National Training and Technical Assistance Center for Child Youth and Family Mental Health in partnership with Touchstone Health Services and the CARE Coalition. Um, I also wanna say that the views do not necessarily represent THS or HHS views. Um, so my name is Karina Herrera and I'm the prevention supervisor. And I wanna give a little backstory of how this uh, training came to play, which is on, um, through our CARE Coalition, we had community members express concerns about what they were seeing in their community, and in fact, what was happening around the world. And so with these concerns, we decided to take some action. Now, some of their concerns were not only the pandemic, but also mental health issues, concerns, as well as racial injustices. So we were very excited when we were able to partner with um, our national, um, let me read that one so I don't mess it up. Um, our Tech, training and Technical Assistance Center for Child, Youth, and Family Mental Health, um, where they were able to come up with wonderful um, material that, um, that they are just experts in. So with that being said, um, I'm happy to introduce um, Dr. Tanisha Freeman Foster and Evelyn Clark to present health and mental health equity, or um, as we see here, equity is an action word. Thank you so much, Karina, and thank you, Erica, for allowing us to be here today to share this information with your group. And thank you all for participating um, in honor and observance of all the things that are going on in the world right now. We first want to thank you all for taking time to be here. And second, we just want to pause and just have a moment of silence for humanity and Black lives and Asian lives and and individuals that are impacted by the, the tragedies and, and everything that's going on in our communities and in our world today. So just a moment for silence. Okay. Thank you all so much. Um, so today our presentation is, is equity is an action word. And we thought of this because a lot of times we talk about equity and we talk about diversity and we talk about inclusion as this thing. And so what we wanna highlight during our presentation today is that it requires action. And so when we think of equity, we think of equity, diversity, inclusion as it is and it does. So it is would be the statements that you place on your website or statements that you email out when there are tragedies or things that happen, or maybe it's a statement that is in your employee handbook. But in addition to that, we want to call awareness to the action that's required around that. So that's nice and that's great that you put a statement out and that people can have a shared vision around what that means. But the question is, what does it do? What does that look like when it's in action? How are we implementing it in our organizations? And so today um, we're gonna focus on that. In this session, um, we are trying to ensure that it's as interactive as possible. So I just wanna put that out up front that we believe that interaction is key to learning um, and having open and honest and authentic discussions around these topics are also critical. And so again, my name is Dr. Tanisha Freeman Foster, and I have my colleague with me today, also Evelyn Clark, who both of us will co-facilitate this presentation today. So our disclaimer is that the information that we are sharing also is not um, a representation of Department of Health and Human Services, and it is not a representation of SAMHSA either. So just an overview of our center, um, our multidisciplinary team includes all of these partners, our partners from CARS, our partners from Georgetown University, Change Matrix, where myself and Evelyn are employed. Also, we have the University of Texas at Austin, Fredla, we have Youth Move National, um, MidStar Georgetown University Hospital, and also the American Academy of Pediatrics. 
So our goal is that all children, youth, young adults, and families with or at risk of a serious mental health um, illness or a serious emotional um, challenge can access evidence-based treatment and recovery services in a well-coordinated system of care. And who do we serve? Individuals like you all who are sitting on our call today and participating in this um, webinar today. So everything from state and local agency leaders to mental health providers, to peer support staff, also faith-based and um, non-traditional providers, those who are out in our community still doing this wellness work, but doing it in um, various innovative ways as well. So our services, some of the services that we provide are individual consultation, peer learning exchanges, such as this one, we have communities of practice. We have a five things digest that are released on um, Tuesdays of each week. We have podcasts and then practical tools. And we also do a lot of training and work around um, helping individuals and organizations be their best selves. And these services um, that are provided on behalf of our funding from SAMHSA are provided for um, free of charge. So again, our presenters for today is myself, Dr. Tanisha Freeman Foster, and my colleague, Evelyn Clark. Both of us are change specialists and equity consultants at Change Matrix, and we work under the INTAC umbrella. So first, we want to also ground today's presentation and today's um, interactive session that we will have in, in our core tenets. And so our goal is that we are able to have this space for authentic conversation, but that our conversations are also strength-based and hopeful that we practice being inclusive and accepting of diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, and experiences, and that it's also healing-centered and trauma-responsive. We invite individuals to participate in their own journey, so that means that wherever you're at in your journey or, of education or awareness around this topic, it's invited and it's in embraced. Also, we use first-person language, which is free of labels, we um, provide feedback in a non-judgmental way and avoiding assumptions. And we also make sure that our language is respectful, clear, and understandable. And that, again, our actions are consistent with our policies and products. So it goes back again to equity is an action word. So today's agenda, we have a quick exercise. We will discuss um, leadership, is equity, we will talk about investing in youth of color. We will talk about why equity matters. We will also participate in a community enhancer. And then we will have call to action, which requires us to first increase our awareness of how we can dig deeper, how we can look beneath the surface and really get to the real issues and to the root of a lot of things that we are working on and helping young people be them best, their best selves and also call to action, things that we can take away after this webinar and after this presentation. So our first community enhancer, and this is similar to an icebreaker. So in the chat box, please describe equity using one of your five senses as a metaphor. So you can say equity looks like, equity tastes like, equity sounds like, equity smells like, or equity feels like. And so an example here is that Equity sounds like an ocean of synchronized waves. And so we'll give you a few minutes to, to put in your thoughts. And there's no right or wrong answer. You make it fun and make it personal. So. So they have equity feels like peace, equity feels like happiness. Equity sounds like every voice being heard with equal importance. Beautiful. Equity feels like care. Thank you all so much for sharing this. Equity tastes like your favorite dish from your favorite person. Wow, I love that.
Equity sounds like no one is better than anyone else. Everyone treats others like they want to be treated themselves. Awesome. Equity looks like everyone standing as one. Beautiful. Equity feels like safety and not being afraid to go for a walk in my community because I'm Black. Powerful. Equity sounds like children laughing. That's beautiful. Equity feels like compassion. Absolutely. Equity, wow. Equity tastes like Baskin Robbins and you want to taste all of the flavors. Equity tastes like a meal, all of your favorite foods from all over the world. Beautiful. Equity tastes like an oversized delicious pie that everyone can have an equal slice. Beautiful. Thank you all so much for sharing. Equity sounds like a choir, of, a chorus of voices all singing together. It's awesome. Equity sounds like a symphony. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Evelyn, to talk about this photo. Hello, everybody. Um, as Tanisha mentioned earlier, my name is Evelyn Clark, and I'm actually calling in from Olympia, Washington, and be gracious with me as I'm homeschooling right now, and little one knows not to interrupt during presentations, but you know, <laughs> she's only nine. So, um, so yeah, so I um, wanted to start off with this picture um, to get everyone kind of thinking um, what we're going to be focusing on today. And so if you could just take a look and type in the chat box, um, you know, some words that come to your mind when you look at this picture. That would be really great and I'll read them off and, and then we can dive deeper into this. So what is it that you see when you take a look at this picture? Proud new beginnings, proud pride, diversity, success, joy, leadership, success, diversity, representation, Accomplishments, the future, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, even corner lines. <laughs> he just got some good lines there, yes. <laughs> um, does anyone like want to take a stab at like maybe what this picture is? Like, have you seen something like this? And this is based out of Washington, so, but I'm sure, you know, in your state. Yeah, so I'll get to where all the women in a second. <laughs> I promise you it's not to be not inclusive of women. Um, but does anyone want to just kind of say, like, maybe a youth program for young men? Awesome. So I won't keep you guessing, and I know I get that a lot with, where's the woman at? Um, so for all of you, this is, I'm really proud. I actually know all of these young men. Um, these are young men who are currently, um, they currently live in Washington, and they are actually incarcerated individuals. So the work that I have done over the past 10 years, I've worked a lot with young people who are incarcerated, as I share that similar experience. I was incarcerated as a young person um, and worked my way to work for the system. And so my whole vision was that young people, you know, especially youth of color, those who identify as Black, Indigenous, or someone of color, that they would be elevated. And so this is an example of, of youth um, working in leadership capacity. So they are currently incarcerated 
Um, and this is actually a Senate bill signing. So what we did with a committee that I chaired at one point is we got these young people together. And the reason why they are only young men in this is because they reside at a facility that is for young men from ages 16 to 25. And then we do have some young women on the committee um, that have done some of this work too. This one I wanna share because these are the young people that their stories connect that they were in trouble at an early age in schools and they did not receive the help that they needed from schools. They ended up you know, getting deeper into the streets and whatnot and, and committed some crimes that landed them 20, 30, 80 years in prison. And um, unfortunately, you know, this bill that they actually helped uh, put into existence, that's our governor, our state governor, Ensley, um, this doesn't affect them. This actually, they have to go on to prison and serve their time, but they wanted to make a difference for the other young people following behind them. And if you, you know, for me, it's like, this is that, it, this is that example of why equity and leadership go together is because we need young people like this to who've experienced what they've experienced and and to help change um, the system and so that's exactly what they did here in our state and so I'm really proud and I'm proud to share and um, I will you know again just iterate uh, that like their young ladies are doing this work in our state as well. So I, I don't want people to think that, but just wanted you to see like, these are, these are the faces that we see that um, don't have the best opportunity and end up with the school to prison pipeline. So thank you for, for your input on that. And, and thank you for the kind words of, of the future. They are our future. They are, um, you know, no matter what, uh, time they have. So I appreciate that a lot. All right. Thank you, Tanisha. So we are going to dive into some definitions. Um, you know, a lot of these are kind of um, buzzwords right now, but for BIPOC, you know, we'll probably say that definition, but it's, you know, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, health disparity um, is really important. So a higher burden of illness, injury, disability, um, experienced by one group relative to another. We have healthcare disparity, which is really helpful because I think that when we talk about like health equity and disparities, um, we try to kind of sum up in one definition. Um, so healthcare disparities, differences between groups and in health insurance coverage, access to and use of care and quality of care. Health equities, the state in which everyone has the opportunity to attain Full health potential and no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or any other defined circumstance. And then we have health equality, which is different from health equity, um, requires that those with the worst health and fewer resources receive more efforts to improve their health. So this is very important to the work that we're doing as it relates to those who identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of color for Many reasons I'm sure a lot of you know um, and see have had this happen um, in people's lives. Thank you. So this is, I think, what, you know, one of the most important parts of the presentation because in order to understand, you know, why does it matter for us to have young people um, you know, changing laws, young people of color, why, why does it matter? Because inequity is making us very sick. And, and we see that, we see that on the news just about every day what is happening. And so, you know, these are, um, these are facts that why, you know, it backs up why we need to continue to do this work. Um, you know, as you can see, as I was just talking to you about the young people in the juvenile justice system, for example, 50 to 75, and I might even say 95%, even just from the work I've done, that youth in the JJ system, they meet criteria for mental health disorders. And most of them are BIPOC. Most of them are young people of color. And I, and I really want to I think we all know that, but you know, when we actually work in those systems and we hear about like what they've 
experience in schools at a very young age to where they are now, um, you know, we have to disrupt that school to prison. And so knowing all of this just really helps us of why this work is important. Um, we know that, you know, for example, black men are overdiagnosed with schizophrenia at a rate four times greater than white male counterparts, meaning we have created stigmas for people of color that, you know, they must be, they must have a mental health challenge. And honestly, in my experience, we've had a lot of um, youth of color who didn't get mental health services as their white counterparts did, they ended up going, as I just showed you, to the prisons, um, getting that time instead of getting intervention. So again, I know these will be sent out to you, but this is just so important that we realize that it's making us all sick as a, as a whole. Um, and so, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you so much, Evelyn. And I think you you touched on it. And one of the things that we have to be aware of also is how inequity shows up in people, how it manifests itself. And these are just examples of how it manifests in mental health. But it also has an impact on how people are able to navigate school, their grades, um, how their future looks, if they're able to go on to college or vocational um, institution or, or university and the impacts of that. And we'll talk about inequity outside of um, mental health, but including all of the aspects that make up the young people that we work with. Thank you. So our next activity is called being my best self. And so what I'm going to ask for you all to do is to take out a piece of paper and something to write with, or if you're using your computer and you're able to pull up a blank piece of paper, please take that out um, and number it um, from one to 10. Okay, so next, I want you to list 10 things that help you or assist you in being your best self. And your list can include people, places, things, food, music or art, or whatever you desire. So 10 things that if you're not feeling well, it helps you feel better. Or even if you're feeling well, it just helps you feel even better. It motivates you, it inspires you, and it can be anything you choose. Okay, does everyone have their list together? Okay, so what I would like for you to do is, is take a look at your list and look at these 10 things that help you to be your best self. Now, what I would like for you to do is cross out number one and number two, because those are not evidence-based practices. That is not something that has research behind it that has been proven to work. Next, I want you to put a line through numbers five and number nine because it takes too long and I need to get home to my family. I have to cook today and I just don't have time for that to, to review this with you. 
Next, I would like for you to cross out number seven because that, that item, that normally doesn't work for people like you. Next, I would like for you to cross out numbers 10 and number four because unfortunately our organization does not specialize in that. And that is not our focus. So we, we can't help you with that. You have to choose something else. Next, um, draw a line through number six and number eight, because you've tried this before and it didn't work in the past. So we're not gonna keep trying the same thing over and over again. So now you should have one item left on your list and that is number three. So we're just gonna take a pause and a moment to, to think about this. So I asked you to think about the top 10 things that helped you to be your best self. And then we went through your list and crossed out all of them except for one. Can you write in the chat box how that makes you feel? Defeated, limited, empty, discouraged, surprised, devalued, discouraged, discouraged, limited, not worthy, lonely. Why try, inept, afraid. Not fulfilling myself. voiceless, thank you all for sharing these, meaningless, judged, And so thank you all for your feedback and for your participation in that. So the purpose of this activity is that when we talk about equity and equity being an action word, we have to make sure that our words align with our actions. And so when we talk about working with young people, if we only look at them from a perspective of a teacher to student or a clinician to a student, we leave out the other parts of them. And so it's important to just as we're working with young people and as we're working with those families that we're not only asking them what helps them to be their best self, but we're actually helping support them in the way that they feel that they need to be helped. And so if it means that we're working with a young person who may be experiencing um, depression or sadness or just not feeling like they belong and we ask them what helps them to be their best self and they tell us basketball and we say, sorry, we don't do that here. Like you need to um, find out where you can play basketball at cause we don't do that here but I can talk to you about your feelings. Taking into account that's the same process that we're doing to that person. The same um, words that we use to describe what that felt like to us, that's what it feels like to other people. If I, you're asking me how I can help you be your best self. And I'm telling you, this is what's gonna help me be my best self. And you ignore it and cross that out because that's not what we do. We do the same thing with young people. And so as providers and as individuals who work with young people, I feel like it is our responsibility and our duty to make sure that we take care of them in a holistic manner. So we may be working in a school as a clinician and we meet with a young person who is struggling in school and they say, I really enjoy playing basketball. And it's not our, our responsibility to say, well, you know, kids like you don't really go to the NBA. So I'm not sure what that's going to do for you. So I'm not going to engage in that. It is our responsibility to find out who that young person can play basketball with. And that may mean engaging with other community organizations. It may mean finding a big brothers, big sisters program or a program at the Y. 
that that young person can engage in that particular activity. And also it's important to look at wellness from a holistic lens. What does wellness mean for this young person? It may not mean talking on, about their feelings to someone or coming to the office and, and sharing their emotions or their struggles in school. They may communicate through drumming. They may communicate through spoken word or through other avenues. And so it's our responsibility to find out what it is. And if that's not our expertise, that we create a warm linkage and a warm handoff to someone who does. And we maintain contact that we just don't say go over there and we let them go. And then we don't know how it, what happens, but bringing that individual or that organization to the table to say, this is our young person and they're interested in playing basketball. What activities do you have there? And also if, if money is a thing, a lot of um, programs have discounts for families with limited incomes and helping the family navigate through that. Even though I'm a teacher, that basketball, I may not understand it or understand how to play, but if I'm truly concerned about the well-being of this young person and they say this is something of value, it's something that helps them express their emotions, that is my responsibility to, to help facilitate that. So next we're looking at the, the structural inequities and biases and socioeconomic and political drivers. And so this chart is a reminder again of how we need to look at and how we must and how critical it is that we look at young people and their families through this lens that although our specialty may be education, they still have other needs. They need work, they need stable income, a thriving wage so that they can meet their responsibilities. They may need access to health systems and services, housing, income, physical environment is important. If you have a young person who has health issues or maybe having trouble with asthma and they live in a section of town where there's a lot of pollution due to buses or due to other factors, that is gonna impact all of these other categories. It will impact how they learn in school. It will impact their health. It may impact the income that that family is able to, to have because of um, doctor's visits and enormous doctor's bills and things like that. And so we have to look at people through this holistic um, lens. And also, again, if we it's not our expertise, whose expertise is it in the community? And I always say we don't want to dilute our, our um, sweet tea. So we don't want to, we have a specialty and we want to take time to really perfect. If our specialty is education, that doesn't mean we can't do these other things, but it's recognizing that that may not be our expertise and that someone in the community, that's their focus. And so how do we connect with them and how do we make them a part of this child and their families? Um, holistic care. And so it may be on Tuesdays, you have someone from the YMCA that is there at the school or someone from the healthcare clinic that is there to provide services. Or if you have a family that is struggling with their housing, there's someone in the community that you have built a relationship with and you can contact and say, hey, I have a family that I'm working with and they need housing or they need housing assistance. Um, can your program um, assist with them? But all of these things impact our young people, how they feel safe in their communities or not. And if they are not feeling safe, that may be one of the reasons they're not showing up at school because it's a struggle to get there. They don't feel safe walking to the bus stop. They don't feel safe walking to school. And so that has an impact on them as individuals. And so we have to really take into account that, that although the focus may be education or health or mental health or mental wellness, that this is just one aspect of this human being. Also, in looking at the individuals and their families from the cultural iceberg, and this is something I really like because it's something that demonstrates how most of the time we only see 10% of the individuals that we work that we're working with. And so with young people, we may know their favorite foods because we know young people like pizza, they like hamburgers, they like chicken wings and French fries and things like that. But that's just 10% of them. We, uh, we may understand their fashion because these are things we see. We may understand certain holidays that they observe because they talk about it at school or because they come with gifts that they've received over that holiday. 
and we may understand their language, some of it, and their music and things like that, but there's so much more underneath that surface. And so there are things that happen within cultures that we really have to take time to understand or we miss out on serving that entire person. So we have different styles of communication, different rules. So we could have a young person and we, at school, we see that they're having issues with their behavior. But be, and we may say this, this family, they need a referral to mental health and that family may not show up and we make a judgment that they don't care, that they don't care about their young people without digging beneath the surface and saying, oh, the reason they're not going to these services is because there's a stigma in their community around behavioral health because the family does not believe that behavioral health or mental health is an issue that they feel like maybe you just pray about it and it gets better or that's you just acting up or you're just being a kid and they may not understand the severity of it. And so it's important to look beneath the surface. Also with this 10% and this 90%, thinking back on the activity that we did a few slides ago, we talked about the things that help us be our best selves. And so again, you had 10 items on the list and you crossed out nine, that's your 10%. So if I took that thing and said, you're only gonna use this 10% and I'm gonna judge you based on this 10%, you're only able to use this one thing on your list to help improve your health, we would all be hurting because we would be missing a lot of the things that help make us who we are, a lot of the things that help keep us well, and a lot of the things that we can turn to when we have um, trouble or, or times to talk about or even happy things to celebrate, all of that will be taken away. And so again, it's, it's just driving home that cultural lens and, and looking beneath the surface and taking time to dig and taking time to build those relationships so that we can learn about these things and also understanding that young people come to us and they have a lot of things going on at that same time they're in school they're trying to learn they're trying to figure out the next steps for their future and they may also be questioning their identity questioning how they belong in their community trying to determine their sexuality trying to determine how they fit amongst their peers and so all of that is at the 90 percent and if we don't take that into account we'll just be serving the 10 percent and most of the time we will miss, miss the mark and miss um, really identifying the real issues. And so getting to the roots, and this is the why, this is a, a slide that we like to use often to find out like, why do we make judgments against people? Why do we not look at inequity from a holistic perspective? And so this is getting to the roots of it. And so when we have thoughts about young people and their families or why they're behaving a certain way, we have to take a step back and say, where did I get that information from? Where did I learn that this particular population is not interested in school and they will leave school and have children early and they don't care about their education or this particular individual is destined to commit crimes because people that in that neighborhood where they live at commit crimes and most of them go to prison. Where did that information come from? Or I'm not making a home visit to this particular family because that neighborhood is unsafe or this particular person has a tattoo where they have an earring in their ear and we size people up and we judge them, which impacts the type of services we provide them and also helps to exacerbate those inequities. And so this requires us to get to the root. Where is it first? Why do I feel this way about this young person or about this family or about this mother or father or grandmother who is caring for, the, for these children? And so sometimes it's embedded in privilege that that has been the way we are raised. We don't see the other side of it. We have not had experience with people who are different from us. Also culturally conditioning, things that we've seen on TV, television shows, radio shows, um, video games, and so forth that has penetrated how we, we think about young people that we, that we work with and their families. Prejudice, ignorance, affirmation, because all the other teachers or all the other clinicians feel that way, and so I'm going to do that as well. It could be the way we were brought up, that we were taught a certain way about, uh, that we were taught about individuals who were different from us in certain terms and that those individuals were not as successful or they were needy or they came to just take and not give to society. It could also be embedded in racism, white supremacy, 
fear and fear of the unknown because you don't know those individuals. And so we make judgments about how safe it may be to be around them or to provide services to them. Also power, reinforcing power and, and dominance over certain groups. Also, we sometimes we overgeneralize people. We've worked with someone in the past who looked like that, who wore a hoodie to school and they did not succeed. They ended up in jail. And so now we, everybody that we work with that wears a hoodie, that they're not gonna do much with their life or maintaining the status quo. This is what happens. This is that neighborhood, kids that come from over there, they normally don't do well. And so we generalize that across all of them. We're not gonna put in as much time or energy to care for them because that's what our experience has been. And so when we're thinking and processing how we work with individuals, it's important to ask ourselves in what ways does these thoughts serve me? And also where did this emotion come from? And then am I ready to change it? Because as people, we can change, we can get to know people who are different from us and, and change the way we, we look at them and change the way we work with them. And so our goal is ultimately to meet people where they are, that people should not have to come out to the edge. And we use this as a graphic of like at any point in time, there should be a no wrong door. So whether young people are at school or young people are at um, recreation or after school program, there should always be someone there to help that young person or their family. If they're struggling with housing, there should be someone there to help with housing. And so at any point in time, we should be there to help the families and the young people that we serve. And so this is the model that we are trying to, to strive to. And so I will just pause here. Um, does anyone have any questions or thoughts so far? I have in the chat box. Um, how do we approach those situations with respect to the family's culture when we are concerned for a youth's mental health? That's a great question. And I think it, be, it comes from a conversation with them and being gentle with them also. But I think listening um, to what the family honors, what it, because they may not even believe in mental health. And so our, I think it's really about communicating those shared goals that both of us want this young person to be their best, that they are struggling right now. And this is neither one of us wants to see this young person struggling. And so what are your thoughts and ideas around how we can improve their life? And we're here to listen and we're here to help. And we're also, we can make some suggestions around it. So I think those, those things are good um, and let's try those out. And then what if we try and add this? What if we had them maybe just speak to someone one time? Or what if, is there a pastor or someone that this young person can speak to? And really finding out what wellness means to that family and finding out how you can help. And I think also owning that this young person um, may have the ideas for themselves. They may know exactly what they want because we found that a lot of young people, no one ever asked them. Like, how can we make this better for you? How can, how can we help you improve in your grades? Or how can we help you feel like you are cared for or loved or that you're a part of this community? And so sometimes it just starts with that, just asking that young person and making them a part of that conversation. Okay, I will turn it over to Evelyn. Thank you. Been a lot, I think, for us to talk in, but I'm excited because we're gonna. Our next section is, you know, where do we go from here? Like, and as we mentioned earlier, you know, we do these webinars, and sometimes we're left feeling like there's so much and so much heaviness from like we know what is happening, right? We see the injustice happening with the the youth and the young people and families we serve, and so. Um, I'm excited because, you know, we're going to be diving into a call to action. So hopefully everybody's ready for that. Um, but it is, it's a journey. And, um, you know, even myself, who I identify as a woman of color, it's a journey for myself as well, as I work um, in the field. And I'm sure some of you can relate to that as well. All right. 
so um, this is similar to the iceberg, but you know, it, this is how we do the work. You know, I think sometimes again, we sit on these webinars and we get information, but it's like, how do we, how do we do um, racial justice work? How do we do EDI work? And we have to dig deeper. We have to, if you could see, I love this, um, this visual because, you know, it, it starts off with the medical model that we're all so used to. And then it's like, you know, has its little shovel there. And it's like, well, if you really want to dig deeper um, and do the work, you have to get to exactly what we've covered, you know, the inequality that's happening in different communities, the injustice, you know, just everything that's happening. Why you know, we understand why um, people of color, primarily black people, don't want anything to do with systems or counseling or whatever it is, because look at what you know, they have to go through every day, have to worry about, you know, am I going to be the next victim of police brutality? So that plays a huge part, the racism on what is going on with that young person and their family, trauma and, you know, um, sexism, poverty, all of these things that, you know, it's like, if you don't, again, if we have certain privileges and we don't know what it's like to experience these things, yeah, we're not going to get it, but we, but we can dig deeper and try to understand for the best outcomes for who we're serving. All right. So this is um, one of my super passions is um, leadership is equity. And the, again, just starting out with that picture of the young of the, with the young men, um, the work that I've dedicated to um, youth in the state of Washington and now nationally, especially youth of color or those who identify as Black Indigenous, is getting them involved in leadership. If we even see our workforce and we see that we need more diversity, more people that the young people can relate to, um, we know that these things are going to build them up to do this work. And I'm super excited about it. Um, you know, one thing is like, I remember getting questioned when I first helped develop this youth committee with incarcerated individuals, and there was all these safety concerns. Well, what if this happens? Or what if the victims find out that they're now on this governor's board? But it's like, you know what, like, these are young people who are victims of trauma themselves. And so why not, you know, have them in these capacities? So I just have some examples here. Um, and I'm not sure if the handouts were sent out, but you know uh, we do have those. But just to really think about what are we doing to connect these young people to opportunity, um, and so there's different ways here um, that I've listed that I think it's super important. We have those who know any young people who had juvenile justice involvement, um, state advisory groups. Um, that's where I really got my start in and in working with young people in the juvenile justice field. Um, contact city officials, um, you know, talk, really talk to your team about what youth voice and youth choice really means. And understanding that in certain cultures that may not be how they do things. So, you know, just kind of, again, just understanding um, who you're working with. Um, you know, research committees and councils, if you all have anything going on, like even webinars, like what better individuals and those who are going through the systems to, to present, right? Um, and please pay for their time if you choose to do that, <laughs> because it's, it's unequitable if we don't pay our young people if they're going to be a part of things, just like how we're being paid now. So I'm super passionate about that. And we have some handouts for you for some more tips on how to really get young people who have been so mistreated by systems how to get them involved in helping system reform. I think um, these, uh, the Youth Collaboration Toolkit will really help you with that piece. And again, why, you know, why is this important? Why is investing in youth of color, those who identify as Black, Indigenous, people of color important? Well, as I mentioned, you know, um, a lot of them make up majority of those who are in the juvenile justice and criminal justice systems. Um, and we know that in early childhood, like students of color are the ones who are suspended and expelled more compared to their white peers. I've seen it firsthand when I was in direct services. 
And I saw a lot of the young people, instead of getting mental health treatment, who were those who identified as BIPOC, they would, again, get more time added on or, uh, versus their white peers who would literally leave with all these services wrapped around them. And some of them had the same exact charges. So in my mind, I'm like, huh, this doesn't make any sense. So again, just really thinking about, you know, why it is super important um, to really invest. Um, and I think we know that we, we see it and we see what is happening and, and we just, we really owe it to our um, individuals, our young people to really build them up um, with everything that they have to face. They make up statistics and systems and whatnot. So thank you so much, Carrie, uh, for sharing those two in the system um, or in the chat box, sorry. <laughs> All right. So here, um, you know, we want a call to action for everybody. And I know that, you know, it, it could be something small, it could be something big. We're not asking everybody to go out and lobby or anything, but, um, you know, just to really have something for yourself to hold on to, I think is super important in this work because we know there's a lot to do and having that focus, I think will be helpful. So we'll just kind of go through this. Um, call to action and, you know, we'll have some time for questions. Thank you. So here, um, this is from Blue Equity in the Center. This is their call to action. So you can look it up or you can, again, see, um, you know, the slides. So personal. So this is where we have to accept that white supremacy is real. We have to accept you know, all these things that are happening and how they affect BIPOC individuals in our country. Um, we have to understand our own biases, even as a person of color, um, I still have biases that I have to check as well. And so um, that's, that's important every day, we have to check that. So, um, all right, so that's our personal call to action, interpersonal. So I love this image because it really is about resetting our minds. I had to do that. I was taught growing up in a Mexican household that, you know, mental health was a way for the white man to get us, um, to keep us stuck. And so again, just like resetting your mind, right? Like we have to, ex we have to respect the lived experience of people of color. Um, so important. And I think Again, that's why I really hone in on leadership with our young people of color. Um, acknowledge the impact of race-based power differentials within organizations. And we know that this is something that is hard for a lot of organizations out there who are saying we wanna do the equity work. However, we know that the leadership at the top may be you know, all white. And so we have to really think about like, how we're gonna reset our mind and be interpersonal about our call to action. Institutional, so um, again, this is you know committing to understand and speaking publicly on principles of race equity. Um, I know that can be very vulnerable, especially if you are a person of color, but especially if you're not, because as a person of color, sometimes, and I've had this experience myself in my previous role at the state, I felt like I was alone in my fight. I felt like I was the only one trying to talk about, you know, DEI and equity work, all this stuff. And it, it felt very lonely at times. And so, um, but find somebody, you know, that a mentor or somebody that you can talk with, because you'll need that for sure. Um, and on the other side of that, I think sometimes maybe the dominant culture feels maybe like they don't have anything to say because they don't want to offend. But, you know, there's so many different resources on how to be anti-racist and allies as well. So if you need those, just let us know. Um, and again, engaging staff and communities of color to inform governance, decision-making and processes. I, you know, and this is something that I really have seen the power in because the work I've done, I've seen the community of colors be able to give their voice. And, and I think it's gonna take a while for systems to really implement it because of what systems have been built on, but I think we're getting there, so. All right, 
so structural. So just be accountable um, at dismantling um, and interrupting things like white supremacy. And remember, even if you want a deeper understanding of what that is, um, you know, please reach out. We have resources on that. Um, but again, what that looks like, um, I can give an example. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have that as well, but just really making sure that we see the power to people of color within organizations. I think, again, what, you know, you hear a lot about organizations really want to do better. They want more diversity, more equity, and, and really diversity might be there. It's just, are they being inclusive? You know, are they you know, being inclusive of people of color, are they at also, are they also in leadership positions, just like, you know, their white counterparts? So really thinking about those things as well. Okay. And accountability. I believe this is our last one. Um, so just making sure that, you know, we complete our own internal work. And like I said, you know, we're human and we all have it. Um, I myself um, have to check my own stuff each and every day I do this work, even when I'm not on the clock. So just think about that. This is an everyday thing in um, what we do. Don't put the burden exclusively on people you perceive to be more conscious. So usually people of color, um, you know, we, I think, assume that just because we are like, we should be out there talking about all this and and it may not be like I can't I can't speak for all Mexican Americans in the U.S. like I I'm from my own family and our culture is different from other and so again just remembering that like <laughs> you know it's not all people of color to explain the system because that is also very um if we experience racism ourselves or discrimination or whatever if you, it's very taxing on our own emotional health so yeah, and just again, hold yourself and commit to doing the work. And you know, you don't have to follow everything on here, but I think this is a good start to look at and to really think about how we do the work. And that really is a call to action, um, all of the things. And we end with accountability because that's really what this work is about. And yes, and we um, are actually ending on this and then we'll have questions, but I really um, appreciate this quote. Um, it is, honestly, I've seen this happen. I've seen this play out in the work I've done that, you know, the youth are not failing systems, that the system is really the ones failing our youth. That, you know, the very youth who are being treated the worst are the young people who are going to lead us out of this nightmare. And again, I can attest to this over and over to the young people I've worked with I have seen them change loss. Like I have seen them, you know, um, be on national committees while being incarcerated or while being, you know, receiving behavioral health services or whatever it is. And, and they have done so much work to really make the system um, better for people. And so, yeah, so we just wanted to share that with all of you and thank you for allowing me to share my experience in space. And yeah, I hope this is helpful to everybody. All right, so now we have questions and I'm not sure how much time we have for questions. <laughs> we have we have time. Um, thank you, Evelyn, for that. So what we will ask, I will stop doing screen share so we can see everyone's um, Faces. So we will open it up for questions. And you can unmute yourself as well. Um, I have a question about when you're speaking to a group, say, for example, when we reach out to our coalition and we want to bring up um, concerns that they may have and maybe they don't feel comfortable because they're going to feel judged or maybe they feel like it's a silly question or irrelevant to someone else, even though it's relevant to them. How do you provide a safe space for them to feel comfortable and for them to even be vulnerable to ask a question that 
again, may feel like is irrelevant to everyone else, but to them, it's really important. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Karina. And I think it goes back to the point of that these conversations are, we call them bold conversations, we call them courageous conversations, we call them uncomfortable conversations in that we have to foster um, relationships with people. And so there are things that I have done in the past to build up to that. So when we have a group that people don't feel comfortable talking is finding other ways that people can share. And so that may mean sometimes we have to be the person that presents the questions, but giving opportunities for people to share. So it may be creating, I've created like a survey monkey that became like a, um, like a depository for questions. And so everyone got the link and we create it and it stays the same. And so it's an open survey monkey. So if we meet on um, a monthly basis or a quarterly basis, like the day before that meeting, I will go into that box and pull out those questions and then bring them up as general conversations that don't include people's names. Um, that's a way I've also had surveys where people could provide their feedback. And in those surveys, I made sure that there was an anonymous, that the, on Survey Month, there's a way to um, check a box so that the survey can be anonymous. So it doesn't track people's IP addresses and letting them know that. And they're like, okay, this is good. In addition to that, providing it in a PDF document that they could type in. So you can't read the handwriting of Calibre 14. So that um, also having opportunities, I've also put um, boxes in the restrooms. So here's the survey and people could fill it out either in the PDF fillable form or fill it out in pen. And it's in a restroom stall. And we created nice little boxes and gift, like wrap them with wrapping paper and put bowls on them. And that served as a posit box. And actually we received surveys from both the men and the women's restroom. And so just making people um, aware that you want their feedback and that their feedback is valuable and also giving them multiple options for sharing their thoughts until we build up to really creating that environment where people feel good about speaking out and don't feel stigmatized or feel like what they say is gonna be, um, they're gonna feel, feel stupid or, or something like that. So it's really about just finding creative ways incognito, um, survey, survey monkey, physical survey drop boxes and restrooms and the break rooms and places where people can just go and sneak in and put it in there and no one knows that they did that. And so those are creative ways. Thank you. I, I also had a, a following up question um, more specifically um, with youth. How, how do you navigate, uh, Evelyn, you've shared that you've worked a lot with youth. Sometimes in our meetings too, we our youth leadership meetings, we find that they get either nervous or they feel shy, that they don't really wanna talk or sometimes they can relate to if, if we're asking them like, do you ever, you know, do, have you felt anything uh, after the pandemic? And maybe they're like, no, but I'm scared to say no because you know, or, or I don't know, maybe I have, and I don't know how to explain it. So how do you positively encourage that conversation with youth? Yeah, and that, um, just so for reference to that youth collaboration toolkit, um, I was interviewed, it's my previous last name, um, Maddox, but it was interviewed and actually talks about these little tips to engage young people. So I'll just quickly share um, that what really helped me um, and the young people I was working with was getting somebody who also had lived experience. So for example, I shared earlier, like I have lived experience um, as a certified peer counselor and I had lived experience in the juvenile justice system. So I, I was able to, you know, make that connection with them on that level and build that trust that I am another individual, basically that's now working in the system and hired to work in a system as a for my lived experience. And so that really did help um, to like make them feel more comfortable or make them or not make them sorry, I don't like to use those words, but like empower them <laughs> to um, to speak up and to speak their truth with power and to do it in a way where they're not, you know, 
blaming or shaming people or systems, but they're speaking truth in how the system did bring more trauma to them or how, you know, say they were in school and they were kicked out at age five or six, you know, how that made them feel. So, so yeah, it's just getting people they can relate to, you know, or people that look like them too, that make them feel comfortable, um, that can share that space with them. And what's really cool about that that toolkit that I'll say um, real quick is that uh, young people were also interviewed. And so they get their sharing in that too, what helps them. And so that will be, you know, cause a lot of them, um, I had the advantage of a lot of the young people knew me in my previous role. So when I became a state worker for this council, you know, they made their little jokes about, oh, now she's a state person. I don't know if we can trust her, but you know, they like, that's another thing though, it's real. Like I would get questions all the time, like how are, how did you get these young people to engage on this governor's council and they're so like anti-system and it's like, well, and again, it's just having that person that can either relate to them. So has that lived experience or that looks like them, right? That can make them feel comfortable. So I would say that, and Tisha, Tanisha, if you had anything to, um, I know that you have experience with that as well. I think you, you have great suggestions with that, Evelyn. I, I would add that giving young people questions ahead of time, I found to be effective. Like, what are we going to ask them? Because I found that sometimes people are like, just bring them and then we'll ask them. That is the most intimidating thing you could do to a young person to go into a room full of adults in positions of power and you just sit there and you have an agenda, but you don't know what they're gonna ask you. And so if we know upfront what they're gonna ask, then we can prepare that young person so they at least have a chance to read over it and think about how they're going to respond and also making sure that we invite more than one young person, more than two, because no one wants to be the only one or the token of like, hey, ask Sarah over there. She knows she works with the young people and it's that thing. I would also say um, we would have pre-groups where we have a young person who would work with the adults. And so we start to formulate questions. And so like that question that you, you said, Karina, about like the impact of COVID in the pandemic, we would ask what we meant. Like, so we want to know if there are any effects um, from COVID, like have people been adversely affected or have they found that this was um, actually kind of work beneficial in their favor because of COVID. And so we would tell that to the young person who was working with them and they would take that back and they would put it in young person language. And they're like, oh, so you mean, are we about that life? And he's like, yeah, that's it right there. And so that thing too of like language and understanding how different people speak and what that means. And for a lot of young people, when you say like, how has the pandemic impact you? They're like, what, what are you talking about? Cause I've been living in a pandemic, like every day, as a person of color going out into the community, wondering if I'm going to be shot or killed or bullied or whatever, that is a pandemic. So which one are you talking about? And so that thing of involving young people and having them at the table, but also trying to share the questions early on and allowing them to have a conversation with you around what are you trying to ask and what are you trying to get at and letting them tailor it to their language and coming back with the response, it, it all, I think it, it worked much better. Because the things that we asked and the way they interpret it is not the same. But when we talked it out, and, oh, you mean this? And we're, yeah, that's what, that's what we mean. And so when they can personalize it and understand what we mean in a conversation prior to the meeting, it helps greatly. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Am I seeing that someone put um, also including questions in a way that gives permission? Absolutely. And someone spoke about, it can be difficult when you're the only black staff who is a social worker and you can see the reservation of, of the families receiving your help and support. And so I think with that, that's a, that's a great point and it is a concern and I think um, like we've spoke about during this session is, is bringing people in that sometimes we feel like we have to do all the work because I'm the social worker or because I'm the clinician, I have to do it all. I have to put this on my back and do it for the school. And so 
bringing other people in it. Who else is interested in this work? And there may be young people who want to be social workers that we can bring alongside of us and mentor, and they can create student-led groups that inform the bigger system of like, this is why we don't trust you. This is our reservation about getting services from you because the last time we received services from someone, someone from Department of Children and Families came to our house and they removed my some of my siblings or we had to do this as a result of that. And the only way you get to that is for people to feel comfortable having conversations. And so I think it is a two pronged approach. You bring a young person alongside of you. It may be young people who are interested in social work. That's a form of mentorship and apprenticeship for them and then allowing them to lead the group. It looks good on their resume. It's a nice volunteer opportunity and you're able to get feedback. And so looking at opportunities from that lens. Any other thoughts or questions? This is your time. So we're here to, to assist, so. And if I could just add real quick, um, a shameless plug, but in July, myself and a young person who I actually was their peer counselor for while he was incarcerated are going to present on um, working with young people in the juvenile justice system as and in a leadership capacity. And, and it's so, you know, we can send that out to people who are interested um, to national under NTAC. Um, because again, you'll hear from that person firsthand and it's really powerful because now this young person is actually doing the work I was doing in the community. Um, and, and so, and now he's actually leading some pretty phenomenal like efforts that are really radical movements in our state. So it's really exciting. And um, anyway, just wanted to, you know, I know that's kind of months away, but it, it is something to like, you know, it goes along with what we're talking about and how we did it and, and the, and the proof, right. And, and anyway, so just wanted to share that real quick. <laughs> That's awesome. Also, I will ask, um, Carrie, if you can also send out our last five things digest that talks about creating and fostering organizations with, um, equity and anti-racism, it has a lot of steps on how to do this work. So from having it, tips on how to talk to people in your organization that are not on board with the importance of this, um, of this work to like funding and how do you create equity if you don't have a budget for it. And it talks about evaluation also. It goes along with accountability that Evelyn referred to, that it's one thing to say that we're going to do this work, but how are we holding ourselves accountable and how are we allowing young people in their families and our communities to say, no, no, you said you were going to do this and it's not looking like that. Like, how can we help make it better? How can we improve? But someone in, in some communities to hold our feet to the fire and say, this is not what you said you were going to do. And being open to, to hearing it, because we, if we say we're going to do the work and we don't do it, we can't be upset and angry when people call us out on it. I would highly recommend, yeah, reading that too. Um, our very own Dr. Tanisha of Raven Foster wrote that and it's like amazing. I've been sending it out to like everybody I know really. Yeah, it's also too, that reminded me, um, thank you for that. Cause it reminded me of, um, we did a school-based Five Things Digest and um, we talked about kind of the school of prison pipeline, but, and we talked, we highlighted that community is the answer. I think sometimes even as a system, for, like I work in the system, we forget that they have the answers, that community is the answer. And so how do we refer to the community to help us and help the young people as well? And so I think that would be another one um, that would be helpful as well. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And I think you bring up a good point too, Evelyn, is that a lot of times the things that we are struggling with are things that the community is working on. And sometimes we don't know. We have a certain group of young people who may not be um, excelling in certain classes. And there may be already a group in the community who is focused on young people who are struggling with math or they have math tutoring sessions. And so again, it's about that. And I think also speaking to the, the poem that, that Evelyn shared about going to the community with the notion of that, not these, these kids are failing in school, but that the school is failing 
these kids in these areas. And we are coming into the community to find out how you can help. And we, we need your help with this. Is there someone who you can connect us to or something that's already going on that we can connect these young people with? Because if we come from the stance of these young people are failing in school, then it's met with defensiveness because we're not taking ownership that it is our responsibility to ensure these kids have the best outcomes and that we may not have all the tools we need for them to be successful. Any other questions? Thank you, Carrie, for sending those out. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, I am going to share my screen again if there are not any other questions so that we can close out. I just okay. want to say, um, Dr. Tanisha and Evelyn, we sincerely appreciate you coming in and, and having these um, sensitive conversations and bringing up a topic that, again, I was mentioning earlier, sometimes they're, they're like you mentioned, the bold ones, the uncomfortable ones, but um, we're all here willing to, to take on that challenge and to to check ourselves and to want to be better for the youth. So I, we really sincerely appreciate you guys being here. So thank you all for the opportunity. And just, I mean, remembering too that the bold and uncomfortable conversations are needed for us to move forward and that they're needed for us to grow. And when we don't talk about it, we stagnate and, and, and prevent our growth. That people need to hear like what you're doing. I know you are well-intentioned, but this is hurting young people. And even if it's people of color that we have become sometimes cultural condition to things that we hear, things that we see, and we may too be causing harm. And so we need to create that system where we can have open conversations with each other around, hey, our shared goal is to ensure that these young people are their best. And these things that we are doing, we are doing well, these things are counterproductive and it's hurting young people. And so we, we need to have space and we need to have areas where we can have like conversations around that and sometimes it is uncomfortable but it's necessary and that's the way we grow okay. so thank you all again for attending our session today and we have a link to um, our survey here if you could please complete that and this is important because it allows us to um, learn what things we did well today what areas we can improve in and it's also a key component of our funding and allows us to continue to provide these trainings at no cost. And this is our contact information. So if you have any questions or uh, concerns for us that you would like to share, we have our email address, a phone number and our website and also our flyer. And we also offer free technical assistance services as a part of our technical assistance center. So if you have a need for those services for someone to come in and to help you um, create an equity committee or equity group with their young people or whatever you desire someone to come in and, and speak with your staff, we're here to help and we're here to provide resources and be able to, I think, um, do that virtually. So that allows us to be flexible and, and reach various areas at this moment. So please feel free to reach out to us. Right, so thank you all again for your time today. And um, does anyone have any other questions before we close out? All righty, so thank you all very much and enjoy um, the rest of your week. Be safe and be well. <laughs>